Okay, so um, yeah, welcome everyone to um, this um, two lecture series, three collections. As Frank said, it's basically the, the only uh, little set of lectures on on standard model. I'm trying, or I will be trying to um, I'll convince you a little bit that um, this side of the standard model is a little bit more fun than the other side. Um, um, basically a little bit different as well as uh, plain old um, QCD. And um, yeah, let's have a go at it. Um, <clears throat> just as a brief overview, um, we'll first, what we, will, what, we, what we will do in this course is we will first have a little um, look into the anatomy of the elect weak part of the standard model. And um, basically when doing this, um, we will already gain um, some insight why, um, well, what the general structure of the electric of, um, of electric effects at higher orders are, and um, why they're phenomenologically quite different than um, um, the standard uh, QCD that effects that you have learned about in, in um, the last one and a half weeks, basically. Um, then, basically, the, the, the program will be very similar to. to um, QCD courses because next thing you, you will want to have a look at is um, how we can actually construct sensible observables that we can calculate and that are meaningful to measure. The key point here is again infrared safety um, and um, so this is basically the theme for the, for the first lecture for today. Tomorrow we then have a look at um, what the corrections look like precisely at next to leading order and um, also at um, higher orders um, by means of resumation or parton showers. And um, we will have a look what kind of uh, impact they make on observables um, phenomenologically. Um, and finally, of course, um, since this is um, partly um, an MCNET school, um, we will of course have a look at how we can incorporate electric corrections into event generators so that um, especially the experimentalist among you can make use of them, can incorporate um, these effects into your analysis or better into the interpretation of your analysis. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, last thing before we start, um, a quick list of um, literature. It's basically, well, the standard Peskin Schroeder book has some useful introductory chapters on this as well. Um, so there's lots of useful information there. Um, if you really want to go in depth on the electric sector, I can really recommend the second book here, um, Böhm den Ayos. Um, this is basically one of the, the, the standard um, books on the electric theory and how to um, calculate higher orders in there. And it goes through all the details and um, everything that you need to know. And last but not least, there's a review article from um, two years ago, or well, not even two years ago now, um, by Dennis Dittmeyer. And um, this um, is both useful for, for theorists and experimentalists and discusses also a lot of uh, um, about electric uh, input parameter schemes and, 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 and things like that. That is also something that's uh, very useful to know for, for, for experimentalists. Um, but some of that we will also discuss in, in this lecture today. Okay, so let's get started. For the first part today, we're going to have a look into the electric part of the standard model. Um, not in too much detail though, so um, I suspect this will not be, be news to most of you. However, I think it's useful to point out a few things along the way, um, basically by, while, while um, I'm reviewing that and um, <clears throat> basically showing where where things come from, how, how things, um, parameters, fields, and so on are related and um, discuss a little bit what kind of impact this will have um, later on in, in towards the structure of um, higher order corrections. Right, <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, so, when we look at the structure of the electric part of the standard model, um, we typically have to look at the Lagrangian first. Um, the, as you all know, the, 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 there's a phase transition in, in, in the standard model from, from its 
um, symmetric phase to its um, broken symmetry phase. And of course, um, at our energy scales, even at, um, at a 100 TeV collider, it's basically still the, the broken phase that is of most interest to us. And especially at, at, at for most observable observables that we look at. Um, so Lagrangian basically all think of this picture here, um, I suspect, and we all have that printed on our mocks and t-shirts. Um, this is really quite nice and neat. And while it's compact, at the same time, it hides the true structure of the electric sector. I mean, it's it's complete, It's it's everything is in there, but um, things are abbreviated a bit too much to, to understand what's happening. All right, so um, let's have a little bit of a closer look. Um, there will be a couple of formula, of course, but um, I try to keep things nice and tidy. Um, right, so let's start with the unbroken standard model. So we've got the standard model, we've got our gauge fields. Here we've got the, the gluon fields for QCD, um, the SU2, um, gauge fields. So these are not the W and Z bosons yet. These are the unbroken W123 um, gauge bosons of the um, chiral left-handed theory. Um, and then we have the um, U1 gauge boson of the weak hypercharge, commonly denoted by B. Then we have the fermionics, the fermionic sector. We've got the left-handed doublets here for the leptons and the quarks, and we've got the right-handed singlet um, fields for the leptons um, down and up quarks. We could add a light-handed uh, right, uh, right -handed neutrino field if we wanted to. Um, however, um, it's completely inconsequential whether we add that one or not, since it doesn't interact with anything. <coughs> right, so, so far so nice, so tidy. So this is a very beautiful, um, very symmetric theory. However, it's also very boring since um, in this theory, everything has to be massless. massless. There's no way to introduce a mass term directly into this um, theory, basically, because we cannot make a singlet under all three gauge groups out of a left-handed field and a right-handed field, um, which we would need for a mass term. So what comes next? Um, or oh, well, before we go next, we basically have this um, covariant derivative here. Again, I won't go into, into any details. Suffice it to say, um, it introduces all the interactions between the gauge bosons and the um, fermions. So these are all the gauge interactions. <clears throat> right. Since everything was massless, we basically need to introduce the Higgs mechanism to generate all our masses. Um, and these are the latter two lines here. And well, they, they are what make things messy and um, not quite so nice and tidy as we, we started out with. Nonetheless, um, we've got our um, Higgs field phi. So this is a complex um, doublet at that point. Um, it has a Higgs potential. And this is the general potential we can write down that is renormalizable with a quadratic and a quartic term. And um, then it has the cover interactions we will need later on. And the only thing to note here, the the, the Higgs, of course, interacts with the gauge bosons directly, whereas the Yukawa terms introduce Higgs boson fermion interactions. Um, the coupling here is not a gauge coupling, it's a simple Yukawa coupling. <clears throat> so this is something structurally quite different. Um, the important bit, of course, is the Higgs potential, and we've, it's nicely and symmetric around zero that we have here, and we're, we're sitting basically on the top of a hill. That's what well, we always like to do, have a good view. Um, However, nature really doesn't want to sit on top of hills, it rather sits in valleys. So this is what we're going to do next. <clears throat> right. Um, before we go on though, um, just as a simplification, if we take the QCD out of, out of our standard model, it basically would mean getting rid of these two terms here. And for, towards our understanding of the electroweak part, it doesn't really matter whether we take these two little terms with us or not. Um, QCD is, is, yeah a nice and tidy small part of the whole thing. Nonetheless, it has a largest coupling, therefore um, it is quite important, but um, yeah, structurally it's a small part. Okay, um, just to understand what we're talking about, um, when we go now to the broken phase, meaning we are going out of um, 
this uh, away from this hill into the global minimum of the potential. That's where nature likes to sit. Um, this is what we mean by, by breaking the symmetry. Basically, if we look around from here, things don't look as nice and symmetric as they used to be up here anymore. Nonetheless, and this is uh, important to state, the symmetry is still there. <clears throat> so um, we now expand our Higgs field, not around zero anymore, but, but around its minimum. Well, it's there's still some symmetry left and it's just one and we introduce basically um, our phi plus and minus field as this complex conjugate and the field um, which um, are our Goldstone bosons later on and the field H, uh, field H which will, will, will be our real scalar Higgs field that we will have later on. V of course is the vacuum expectation value. Um, <clears throat> right. So as I said, the, the SU2 cross U1 symmetry is still there just because we are not sitting in the middle of it. It will not be apparent in what, what is to come. So if we, we, we use our um, field Higgs field, capital Phi, expanded our, around um, our minimum, our vacuum here, um, it will not look symmetric anymore. There is one symmetry left that's basically going around the rim here. And um, this is our um, if that's a U1 that's left, then it will turn out this is um, our normal QED. Right, so let's look at, at the Lagrangian of our broken standard model. That's the one we're actually going to calculate with um, um, in the future. And <laughs> what we start out with, of course, um, with the gauge fields and the fermion fields, nothing has happened. Remember, all we did is um, we moved into a different part of the um, Higgs potential. So. To this part of the Lagrangian, nothing really happened. So the gauge interactions are still the same. Um, the gauge fields are in principle still the same and um, their self interactions are as well. Right, but we've changed the Higgs part of the potential. So um, we now have our small field H, um, which has its own mass term here coming from the potential where we moved to. Um, and we've got lots of interaction terms between the Higgs field, the, the W, um, field and the B fields. Um, then we have um, bilinears, basically. Um, these will turn out to be mass terms. These come from um, um, the Goldstone bosons and um, they will basically be absorbed in our physical definitions of the um, um, W bosons and, and, and um, other gauge bosons um, here and they will they, as you see, give rise to mass terms. And of course, then we've got our U cover terms. Um, here, as you see, there's this, this leftover bit of V plus H. So um, the terms that are proportional to V, um, they are bilinears in the field um, and they will give rise to mass terms. And the terms proportional to H, they are trilinear. So they are trilinear couplings between the left-handed leptons, right, or left-handed fermions, right-handed fermions and the Higgs field. So that's the general structure of it. Um, this is still very compact, but um, as you see here in the mass terms, it's not in terms of our physical fields. Why is that? Because as I said, um, uh, mass terms are basically the bilinear terms that we have in our um, Lagrangian. However, they are not bilinears in the same field. We never have um, field and, and complex conjugate or something of that field um, times the mass term, but instead we have something that is more, that is a mass matrix here for basically the W1 and W2 field here, for the W3 and the B field here, and then for um, all the um, different generations of um, the leptons and quarks. Um, <clears throat> right. What we're mostly interesting, interested in at the moment or for, for, for the sake of electric corrections is actually um, the physical electric gauge bosons. Um, so what we have to do is we have to di diagonalize these mass matrices here. Um, how can that be done? Well, the first one um, is basically di diagonalized by introducing the W plus and W minus um, gauge bosons as linear combinations of the W1 and W2. And um, why do we call them W plus and W minus? You can, um, this is because you can show that these then under the rem remaining U1 um, transform as either positive or negatively charged objects. Um, 
So these are really com linear combinations of those. Um, for the um, B and W3 bosons, it's not quite so simple, but it's still um, basically just a rotation in that in the relative space, and they will give us the A and the Z boson. Again, we we can see if we look into the transformation of these bosons under the remaining U1 gauge symmetry that these are both neutral. So these will, will be our physical photon and our physical Z boson. And the transformation matrix is basically given by um, the weak mixing angle. Um, SW here defined as uh, the, signs, um, the sign of the uh, mixing angle. And this is really just a shorthand for a combination of our um, couplings G of and G prime of the weak hypercharge associated with the B boson, right? So got the sine squared and the cosine squared basically just as, as a ratio of these couplings. Um, so if you put that all back into these two equations, uh, these two lines here, we will see that um, these W bosons that we have formed here have a mass that is that is given by one half the couplings times um, the vacuum expectation value and the z mass is given time uh, by by one half of the vacuum expectation value by, uh, times this combination of the um, charges and of course um, uh, one, you will see that um, the photon remains massless therefore this is really the gauge boson of our remaining um, qed Putting these numbers back into here, we will have alternative definitions for our weak mixing angle now in terms of the masses. And this is really what you may already know as um, the weak mixing angle of the sine squared of the weak mix mixing angle is given by one minus the ratio of the masses of the W and Z bosons. Right, um, as I said, there's a remaining U1 um, um, gauge symmetry left, and this is our conventional QED. It does have a coupling after, remember, we've transformed our gauge bosons here, therefore um, the, this gauge boson A will have a different coupling associated with it, and this is, we call this E, and this is um, given by the original couplings G and B, G prime in this combination here, and again, uh, putting in the masses, we can e equally well express it as the ratio of the W mass, the mixing angle, and the vacuum expectation value. Um, we commonly um, insert also the parameter alpha, which is really just the common um, um, square of um, the elementary charge E here. Um, <clears throat> so this is commonly done because most processes um, in their cross section are proportional to alpha and not to E itself, so always to E squared. <clears throat> okay, a quick side note at that point, um, and that's really just a quick side note is um, we won't go, go into any details here. The Yukawa interactions, um, as I said before, they provide the mass terms for the quarks and leptons um, after we've diagonalized them and they will give rise to the CKM matrix um, and the quark generational mixing um, uh, later on once they're put into, into um, cross-sections, basically. And this obviously is a very Im important part of the Zenon model as well. Um, nonetheless, because of the CKM matrix is mostly diagonal, um, accounting for, for, for the off-diagonal effects in the CKM matrix is normally a tiny perturbation on top of um, um, the general electric effects or even at higher orders and therefore is mostly not, not accounted for. Um, there are some processes or some precision uh, measurements where this um, is an important input. For example, when, when, when we talk about um, extracting W masses or, or similar position observables in the standard model and um, then we have have of course to, to account for that as well but typically that's really just a, um, a, a small effect in, in most processes um, another side note um, even though the higgs fermion interactions have nothing to do with the um, electric gauge interactions are really and we're really just um, a yukawa interaction therefore they, they should come as some order counting in, in the yukawa interaction they are typically lumped together with, with the electric correction. So when we talk of order alpha corrections, 
um, in, the in some standard model calculation or even some BSM calculation, then um, what we mean is not just um, order alpha, but also um, order Yukawa corrections. That's um, a minor side note on 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 the um, yeah on the um, yeah notation that is used or maybe even abused here. But um, this is what what's typically done. Um, for, from for most fermions, the Yukawa interactions aren't really um, that useful or interesting because they, they, their mass and therefore also their covers are incredibly small. But at the same time, I'd like that it's at least for the top quark, the Yukawa is of order one. And therefore <laughs> this really doesn't, well, this qualitatively also behaves quite differently than, than the standard um, order alpha corrections. But that would be um, processes where you have Higgses and top quarks um, in it at the same time. There are some of interest, of course, but um, it's it's a limited set. Right, <clears throat> so let's continue. Um, as I said before, um, or as we've seen before, we, we've got plenty of parameters in the electric standard model. We've got our couplings, G, G prime, and, and maybe E or alpha. Um, we've got plenty of masses, so we've got the Higgs mass that, that be generated out of the Higgs potential. We've got the W and Z masses that um, originated in, in basically uh, coming from the Goldstone bosons um, and through the mass matrix diagonalizations. And then we've got the lepton and quark masses coming out of the Yukawa sector. Then of course, there's the Higgs potential that has a couple of parameters V um, for the vacuum expectation value that, um, that, um, that we have in the minimum. Um, then we have, of course, the potential parameters mu and lambda. And then, of course, there's the mixing angle sign um, of theta w. Um, and as a side note here, again, um, v is quite commonly substituted for gf, which is the mu and decay constant. Um, the main reason is that we can not measure v very, very straightforwardly, um, but we can measure the mu and decay to very, very high accuracy. So. Um, and um, these, if, if you look it up in the literature, they, 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 they're basically uh, directly related, these two um, parameters, so they can be, one can be swapped for the other. Um, but in general, as you see, plenty, plenty of parameters, but, and this is a big but, not all of them are independent. As we've seen before, for example, um, the vector, um, um, the Higgs potential is given by mu and lambda, and therefore um, the vacuum expectation value V is also given by mu and lambda. At the same time, um, the weak mixing angle is, is just a shorthand for one minus um, the W mass over the Z mass spread. So um, not all of these parameters are independent, and um, this is something that has to be kept in mind. Um, <clears throat> so that basically uh, brings me to to the fact that you have to group them into two different groups. Ones are your your input parameters, and the other ones are your derived parameters. <clears throat> um, the input parameters are, are really really genuine parameters that um, take some value that I, you have to supply to the model. The model can't can't tell you anything about that. Um, Basically, if you, if you would look for a QCD analog, this would be the same as the, the, the strong coupling or the, the, the mass at the top in, in, in QCD, and um, they would have to just have to be supplied. Um, in the electric sector, it's the same. We have our input parameters that ha just have to be supplied. All other parameters are then really just shorthands um, to keep our notation tidy and, um, yeah, to, 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 to just to abbreviate other combinations of input parameters. And now, of course, because all these um, relations between the different parameters are cyclical, um, we can choose a suitable set um, of input parameters and then treat all of the, the, the other ones as derived parameters. So there's, there's a couple of commonly used um, input parameter schemes. And that basically defines your set of input parameters. For example, we've got the alpha of zero scheme given by alpha 
at zero momentum transfer, so in the Thompson limit. So this is really the one over 137, the W mass and the Z mass, for example, and that of course is um, suitable for processes with real photon photons in, in, in your process. Um, then we've got the GMU scheme, again, a very common scheme for, for calculations at, at um, colliders, um, at the electroweak scale in, in particular, and the, the input parameters here is the, the um, muon decay constant, GF, and the W mass and the Z mass. And it's especially useful for anything that has to do with um, W interactions between fermion currents, basically what, what is happening in the, in the muon decay. Then we've got the alpha from Z scheme. Again, this is a very common scheme used in event generators. It makes use of, or it needs the value of alpha at some high scale. Commonly, um, it's the scale of the mass of the Z boson here. Uh, of course, at the gauge boson masses. And um, as in none of the previous um, schemes, um, the weak mix angle, angle was, a, was an input parameter. Um, we also have a, um, a scheme where the weak mixing angle is an input parameter because um, there is some experimental desire and also um, um, theoretical need for um, actually determining what the weak mixing angle is. Um, however, for, for actually make a determination of that to, to measure that value, we need a scheme where it is an input parameter. Now, since the W mass, the Z mass and the weak mixing angle are direct, directly related, um, in basically a triangle type of relationship, um, we can only have two of them as input parameters and the third one as a derived one. So we have to sacrifice one of the masses if we want to have the weak mi mixing angle as an input parameter. So this is what we do here. Um, and typically we, we sacrifice the W mass since in processes where we measure sine theta um, is our process where we have Z bosons. So we keep that as an input parameter too, right? And then of course, do not overlook the remaining Higgs boson leptonic quark masses that have to be supplied. <clears throat> um, mixed, mixed schemes are possible for, for um, well-defined gauge invariant sets of electric diagrams, but in general, it's, it's best to stick to one scheme throughout a calculation. All right. <clears throat> that basically summarizes what I said before. So really, um, only input parameters are free parameters, all the other ones derived parameters are really just short hands to keep the notation tidy. Um, and as I said, MW and Z and sine theta are not independent and um, they cannot be measured or extracted from data simultaneously and independently. So um, yeah, you have to choose the scheme that goes with the parameters you want to extract from your data. Okay, so far for the model and so far for, um, um, that's all, but that's at least the most important bits that um, we need to know about the electric part of the standard model and its constraints. And um, also in, in terms of um, what we can expect um, for higher order corrections. So um, just as a quick recap, um, we've got a clear set of, of input parameters and derived parameters. We have, um, in, well, Masses are in integral to the electric um, part of the standard model. So something like the massless limit isn't really very useful when we talk about electric gauge bosons. It may still be useful for the quarks and leptons though. Um, and then of course we've got um, our two couplings, either G and G prime or um, given by um, the electromagnetic coupling E and the weak mixing angle that modifies it into the order that relates it to the original G and G prime. Okay, so, so far for the model. Now let's have a look what the, what, um, the structure of higher order calculations in the electric standard model looks like. Um, so first and foremost, um, once I go to the full standard model, basically, QC and electric corrections are really only defined by um, counting the powers of alpha and alpha S. So there's nothing like, um, I want to have a QCD co um, correction and basically what, I, what I'm doing is I, I, I'm adding a gluon in, in, to form, to form a, um, a gluon loop in, in a diagram or something like this, or I add um, 
a jet as some extra radiation or a parton or something like that. Um, it really doesn't, doesn't work like that. Um, to give you an example of what it actually looks like um, in, a, in a real world process, so let, let's consider, um, say, Z plus two jet production at a Hadron Collider. Right, so we start with, um, so the, the leading order process, and this is, as you know, Z plus two jet production um, proceeds uh, as a tree level at many different orders. Um, there, there exist diagrams um, that lead to the same final state and therefore have to be included in the calculation. Um, <clears throat> right, so what's typically known as a leading order process because alpha S is so much larger than alpha, um, is the leading power in alpha S. Now, um, that is a bit of a phase-based dependent statement because um, phase, this is really just a power counting statement here and um, phase-based dependent, we all know that um, this alpha to the fourth term sometimes um, um, is much larger than that, that term here. And um, um, I'll give an example of that in, in a second. Okay, but let's just look at this um, commonly denoted leading order term here, the one with the largest power of alpha s. And just to give you an example, what kind of diagrams we have here, we, for example, we've got um, incoming gluon and, and, and quark um, going into an outgoing gluon quark and the lepton pair. So this would be um, just a typical diagram at this order for this process. Then we have our next leading order QCD correction to that. And we increase our, so how do we get to the next leading order QCD correction is, um, this is by increasing the power of alpha S by one. Incidentally for that process, this really means adding a gluon for a gluon loop or adding um, um, an extra emission um, by a gluon here, or we could equally well have a quark emission here. So far, so simple, so good. Um, now we've got our next leading order electroweak uh, correction. And what do we mean by that? Of course, we inc increase this time not alpha s by one, but alpha by one. Um, this brings us here along this um, blue path. And um, now we have to calculate all contributions to that process at order alpha s, alpha to the third. And what do they look like, for example? For example, we've got um, virtual corrections like this. This is the vertex correction for the um, Z quark coupling. Or we have an emission of an extra um, um, real photon like this over here. Now, as we see, we have all these subleading blobs here as well. And they can enter the fray just the same. Um, we've got the subleading leading order contributions here. And for example, in the alpha to the four blob here, we've got VBF type diagrams. This is Z plus two jet, just the same. Um, so experimentally it's in, indistinguishable from, 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 from the former one. And um, for example, this is uh, VBF type topologies, but at the same time, we've got vector boson Strahlung's type of topologies um, as well, or we have diboson um, topologies where one of the bosons goes um, leptonically, the other one goes hadronically. Um, again, um, they lead to the very same signature, two jets or two QCD jets here and two leptons in the final state. There's no way to, do, to, to distinguish them on that basis. Um, right, so this alpha to the fourth process um, is um, certainly part of that. And as you all know, because there's VBF, there's um, diboson, there's phase-based regions where this is the dominant process over this alpha S to the two, alpha to the two process. Um, <clears throat> then we come to this one in the middle here, alpha S, alpha to the three. And this one is actually kind of interesting because um, it is actually an interference contribution. So it, it's not of the type um, where just, we just have a matrix element squared, um, but it's rather of the type where we've got a real, um, um, the real part of um, one matrix element times a different one complex conjugate. So if we want to draw that, um, it is not enough to just draw one matrix element on the one, one diagram, but we'd, ra we'd rather have to, to draw them both, basically M1 and M2 complex conjugate. And this is 
typically done in, in a way or similar like this. You've got one matrix element on the other, on one side, one on the other side, um, a different one, um, and they interfere. So for example, if we here we have a dibonum process, uh, what I've already designated for before dibosan process. If I can't count my couplings now, this is e to the four. And now I've got a um, um, this process on the other side, and this would be e to the two and um, um, the strong coupling gs to the to the second power. And if I combine those, this is strong coupling um, to the two e to the six or alpha s times alpha to the third. So this is directly a contribution at that at that order, and um, yeah. And since this is not a matrix element squared, but rather an interference term, it doesn't. Uh, it's not um, positive definite anymore. So this um, interference term in the middle has an ind in indeterminate um, sign. Um, and that that respect. Um, it's quite an interesting contribution. It can be positive. It can be negative. Um, it can be large, it can be small. In these types of processes, it turns out it's um, small most of the case. But that's um, here a consequence of um, the color algebra. In general, this doesn't have to be the case. Um, this contribution can also be pretty large. All right. And going one step further, this also means that um, what I designated NLO electroweak before here, and if I look closely at the diagram, I actually see that um, this has a component which is not structurally, not, not an electroweak correction. Um, so basically an additional electroweak loop to, to this leading order process, but this has a component that is actually a QCD type correction. So a QCD type loop, I just added the glue onto what I had before to, to this different, um, um, born type tree level correction to, to basically to, to a, a different sub leading leading order contribution. So at next to leading order electroweak, I do not only, on, in general, I do not only have um, this typical contribution that I sort of, I am used to when I think about higher order corrections, but I also have um, completely say non electroweak types of um, contributions that are basically QCD um, corrections to a subleading board. And this is very important to keep in mind because their structure and therefore also their behavior and phase space is quite different. And then of course, there's all the subleading next to leading order contributions, alpha s to the um, alpha to the four, or alpha to the five. And there we encounter diagrams that um, have Higgs bonons in them, um, sometimes also the, where the Higgs cell couplings enter, though not in this process, or um, where top, top quarks enter, or things like that. Right. <clears throat> um, the next thing I have to keep in mind is, again, um, we're drawing very heavily comp um, comparisons or, 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 or parallels to, to QCD at that point. Um, and it's not something that we're used to thinking about in the electroweak sector. Um, in QCD, you very well differentiate between your short distance objects, quarks and gluons, and your long distance objects, your observable ones that hit your detector, namely hadrons. And in QCD, that's sort of natural because um, we have a phase transition in between. In the electroweak sector, we do not have that phase transition. Nonetheless, um, we need to differentiate short distance objects that live on um, basically the interaction scale, something like the electroweak scale, um, and long distance objects. These are the ones that travel to the detector. So these are um, yeah, something at, at very low virtuality or, or, or um, long lifetimes. And um, <clears throat> so these, these are states that travel macroscopic distances. Um, here we have, we run a bit of, because there's no phase transition, we run a bit of a problem with language. So we have to be a bit careful and, and um, understand um, um, a bit of the nuances there. Um, in particular, we basically use the same word, say photon um, for the short distance photon, the one that uh, takes part in the interaction, as well as um, um, the photon that hits the detector. So for example, a photon that participates in the hard projection is not the same as a photon that hits a detector. Um, they live at different energy scales. And um, so 
this distinction has to be kept in mind. And um, similarly, the same holds for leptons. Um, how is that important? Um, <clears throat> right, I, I get to that in a minute, but how that is important. It, um, but this plays into the same role as, as um, the definition of infrared um, safe observables. And same as in QCD, as soon as I, uh, I have a theory that has massless gauge bosons and possibly massless fermions, um, I need to restrict um, the range of meaningful observables to infrared safe, safe ones, um, namely ones that are insensitive to collinear or soft um, emissions. And what this basically means is, um, as the probability of, of infinitely softened or collinear um, photons and photon splittings into fermion antifermion pairs is divergent, um, observables must be insensitive to such emissions. And um, this is this is crucial for the same um, reason as it is in QCD. Otherwise, um, um, my answer wouldn't or cannot be stable um, in higher order calculations and is in principle. <clears throat> in general, we can define collinearly unsafe observables um, by using fragmentation functions. And this is typically what is done because um, um, we want to observe single muons and in vector, for example. Um, but for that, I would need to, to use a fragmentation functions or simple stand-ins for those. And their, their whole objective is transferring short distance objects into long distance ones. So um, they're the completely proper way to go, but um, it can be quite cumbersome sometimes. Um, and they're, they're sometimes I have to revert to, to simple standards. Right. Um, so um, that brings me to, to the next question of basically the definition of physical objects. And the first one, as same as in QCD, is, is what is a jet? And um, in QCD, I had to uh, basically include quarks and gluons in the jet because there's collinear singularities between quarks and gluons. And to construct something that is um, infrared safe, I um, need to basically define a jet algorithm that is um, combines them in a, in a collinearly safe, safe way. Um, the same has to be done here. Only this time, it's not just quarks and gluons, but we also have to include photons and leptons in our jet definition. Um, the reasons, of course, because there's collinear singularities between um, all of these particles. Now, same as in QCD, um, I can ask myself, but to what extent do they have to be part of the jet? Um, I certainly, prob probably at least, don't want to be all leptons to be part of the jet. I need, I know that I have to keep the very collinear ones in, um, but maybe not the um, well, uh, well separated ones. And of course, that's a qualitative statement, and that has to be quantified somehow. Um, but in the first. And the first picture is, is basically, how do I really um, cluster my jet? And the first answer is democratically. I just cluster everything that I find into jets. I can definitely do that. It is definitely um, very well defined. It's infrared, straight, uh, infrared safe, and it's very straightforward. Um, on the downside, it will have many, many contributions because I need to calculate all the pr production of quarks, leptons, jets, and everything that, that, I, that can, can contribute to the same process since everything is a jet now, and um, that's all right. But I also have to be aware of that everything is a jet now. So single photons constitute a jet, single leptons constitute a jet. And with that definition, as straightforward and simple as it may be, everything's a jet and all I'm ever going to measure are jets. Um, useful for, for some things, for example, if I want to have an exclusive jet cross-section, not so useful if I wanted to have a bit of a flavor um, decomposition and be it only measuring something leptonic because I don't have any leptons anymore, I only have jets. Um, okay, fine, but um, maybe not the use, most useful definition. Um, then the next one is what I can do is, is 
anti-tech jets um, with certain flavor content. The same as I would, for example, in, in QCD define a B jet, for example, I can define um, what is a lepton jet now. It's, it's basically something that is mostly lepton, um, has a net lep lepton number and doesn't have too much stuff around it. So um, yeah, it it's, must not have too much other con contributions in that same jet that are not lepton. That is certainly um, um, a good definition. It's very much in line with what a fragmentation function would do. And um, it's, however, it needs a lot of care to be well-defined at all contributing orders. And especially with the subleading next to leading order contribution, that's not always straightforward. So um, the proper answer always would be to use proper fragmentation function, but just as for example, in QCD, you've got um, the smooth cone isolation for photons, so such that you don't have to use photon fragmentation functions. Um, you can use something very similar here um, by just tagging jets with say a, lep um, a net lepton number and define this as a lepton. And this works um, for, for a wide range of processes, but this um, not exactly the same as the proper treatment with the fragmentation function. Um, let's have a look at a bit of an example. I did production at the LHC. And um, here, for example, you can, to measure the algebra production at the LHC, you can, can define jets completely de democratically, including all the massless and visible particles of the stellar model. I don't need to include, include neutrinos because neutrinos don't have any soft or collinear singularity attached to them because that's basically because they only couple to Z bosons and Z bosons are massive. So that's fine. So I include all the visible particles of the standard model in my jet clustering. That's fine. So at leading order or alpha S squared, I've got the usual gluon scattering like this. I've got quark scattering like this. I've got um, the subleading orders alpha S alpha, where I basically interfere now a QCD diagram with an electroweak one. That's fine. That's a contribution. And then I've got the order alpha squared term. And for example, I've got quark scattering in this form here. So this would be hadronic trillion. So I've got a Z boson in between, which then decays into a um, quark anti quark pair. And again, you look at your di diboson sample, you've got two jets in the final state. It's the same thing. So it needs to be part of that calculation. Only it's suppressed by um, two powers of alpha versus two powers of alpha S that I had before. Now, at the same time, remember we're clustering everything into jets um, to avoid collinear singularities. Um, I've got also leptonic Drillian in that sample. And maybe I just want to have it in there or maybe I do not really want to have that in, in there. So what can I do? I can anti-tech um, jets against leptons. So I exclude all the jets that have a let, net lepton number within them. So for example, if there's a single lepton in there, it will have a, either plus, um, um, plus one as a lepton number, um, plus one here or minus one as a lepton number here. However, if they um, become collinear and the jet um, then will have two of those leptons in them, um, it will have a net, net lepton number of zero, a plus and a minus, and um, it will have a net lump, lepton number of zero, as I said, and I will then not um, tag it as a lepton because um, that cannot be produced by um, a collinear photon to lepton lepton splitting. So that directly implements my um, um, collinear safety. Now, there might be a couple of caveats, for example, and this is a very real caveat for, for um, all the experimentalists among you. Um, Jet, jet acceptance in, in, in a, in a, in a um, detector and leptin acceptance may differ and they actually are different. So there's part of your detector where um, you cannot necessarily tell what is a lepton and you just measure general energy deposition. You don't know what it's coming from, whether it's coming from a lepton or from, 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 from a hadron. So um, in that part of the detector, actually, your energy deposition, when, when you know, don't know what it's coming from, it may be a lepton, maybe a hard one, and maybe a photon, maybe anything. So um, there, this distinction between quark and lepton, or hard one and lepton, um, 
really doesn't play a role for, for your observables. So you may want to limit in this example here, your anti-tech of jets against leptons to a certain acceptance region. So that's all possible and that has all been done in the literature. <clears throat> Um, next question is, of course, um, when I don't want to have just jets, I may have may want to have photons. And again, I would have to differentiate between short distance photons and long distance photons. Um, these are the ones, um, just to remind you, that are identified and um, measurable in the detector. And as I said before, the identification um, works through um, a fragmentation function. Now, the fragmentation function for a photon, basically I've got an external photon here at leading order, it's really just the photon. So this is a delta one minus Z term, where Z is the energy fraction of the um, long distance photon um, that it has from the short distance photon. And at leading order, they have the same object, I don't lose any energy, that's fine. At next leading order, I really have just this quark loop or, or fermion loop contribution. Um, it's still a de delta one minus Z in the energy fraction. I cannot lose any energy at or alpha. Um, however, there's, there's a shift in, um, due to this virtual correction, there's a shift in the coupling. And this is exactly um, this um, factor here, alpha of zero of, over uh, of some, some alpha in the short distance picture. And this directly leads to the alpha of zero scheme for identified photons. Only at next to next leading order, so at alpha order alpha squared, I will have some additional contributions proportional to delta of one minus z, um, something like this here, where I radiate a fermion pair, and um, um, this will have some distribution then. But again, this only comes in at next to next leading order and up to next to leading order. Um, basically, my short distance photon is my long distance photon, only that I have to replace the coupling. Um, by the coupling in the th uh, from a short distance coupling by the coupling in the um, Thomson limit. So that is nice, nice and neat and tidy and sort of this is the explanation for um, why in a calculation what you have, may have seen in the past um, photons are treated a bit differently in terms of the electroweak coupling. And last thing, what is a lepton? Of course, I want to measure leptons as themselves and not just as jets. And again, uh, um, you would have to distinguish between short distance parton leptons and long distance identified measurable objects. Um, for leptons, it's even simpler than for, for gauge bosons because, uh, because um, they don't, don't sp um, split and, and change their flavor, but they basically just radiate photons. Um, so that the standard lepton to lepton fragmentation function is basically something like this. Um, the leading term is delta one minus z, and then there's order alpha corrections. And it's not a coincidence that the picture looks basically just like a jet. And the reason is because it is just like a jet. It's, a, it's an object that radiates lots of other things. I build a cone around it, and I sum up all the radiated energy into that final object. And this is what is commonly known as lepton dressing. Typically in, in, in lepton dressing, you just choose your um, cone size somewhat smaller than you would do for a QCD jet. Nonetheless, it's the same thing. It's really just an electric, an electric jet. Um, you can also produce leptons out of short distance photons, so long distance leptons out of short distance photons. Um, this starts at order alpha. Um, typically, it's not a problem unless you have um, processes with leptons and unresolved photons in the bond process. So for example, you would have something like Jan and um, plus um, um, some PT. So Jan at finite PT and your recoil is given not by, by a QCD jet, but rather by an unresolved photon. It's a sub subtlety contribution. That's why it's normally not taken into account. But once you would do so, um, you would have to take into account that this um, photon in the bond process may split at, at higher orders into, into a lepton as well and may give you a lepton. So that would be a con um, contribution there. And of course, you can get leptons out of quarks and gluons as well, but they enter only at next to next leading order or at um, third leading order. order. So in, in summary, we basically have different types or uh, different definitions of lepton. The, the, the standard one is the dressed lepton. And this is really just like a QCD jet, just for a lepton. 
um, just like the picture here says. Then if you have massive leptons, of course, there's no collinear singularity between um, a lepton and radiating photons. Therefore, you can measure it bare. So bare means just the lepton itself without um, summing up the energy that goes around it. And that is fine, but has, of course, logarithmic dependence on, on, on the lepton mass. Last one I include here for, for um, completeness because it's used oftentimes in experimental analysis, and this is the Born lepton definition. So what is basically done is you measure a lepton, you compare it to your Monte Carlo, and you um, take your Monte Carlo and um, ask it what kind of, um, or how did you arrive at this um, dressed lepton basically from some Born definition that is deep inside you. And this is not an infrared safe concept. Please don't go anywhere near it. Um, as John said earlier, it's um, basically you can use this definition, you can publish a data in that, you can do a measurement in that, but what you preclude is that this data is any useful for posterity. It's um, this data can, for example, later on never be used to compare it against an improved description of the electric sector. So if I've unfolded my data back to born um, leptons with a certain um, state-of-the-art art Monte Carlo at a given time. Um, I did that, but um, say later on, I want to use that data to, to um, confront it to a higher higher accuracy Monte Carlo. I would not do that. So um, basically when, when I've corrected it back to born lepton, I intrinsically have folded it, um, the approximation that was available at the time. And if I was to improve upon it in, in the future, um, this data would not be useful anymore. So please, please stay away from that. Um, use some, as you do in QCD, use some physical um, lepton definition. Um, the last quick thing I was going to touch is basically renormalization schemes. And this is very closely tied to the um, input parameter um, schemes that are, are, are available. Um, the main reason I touch upon it, because ob obviously at higher order electro week, um, you have to renormalize and um, um, your renormalization scheme and therefore also the, the intrinsic renormalization conditions play an integral part in, in um, what your input parameters are actually doing and how your higher order electro week correction behaves. Um, the key point in the electro week sector is that um, leptons and photons are contrary to quarks and gluons asymptotic states. So, um, and our vector bosons, they have produced a clear bright wigner shaped resonance. Therefore, we um, um, want the renormalized on-shell, uh, renormalized masses, we want to renormalize them on-shell such that the location, for example, of the propagator pole for the um, vector bosons doesn't receive higher order correction. So no matter at which order I calculated, the position of the pole is always at the same place. That doesn't mean that the shape of the resonance is always the same, but the position of the pole is at, always at the same place. And this is what on-shell renormalization schemes do for you. And this is typically what is adopted in um, electric higher order corrections. Contrary to say, for example, the MS bar scheme in, in QCD, where um, if you put, put, put masses in and not set all the masses to zero, um, the mass runs in the MS bar scheme. So it's dependent on what kind of energy I, or what kind of scale I put in my process. Um, one of the drawbacks of this of on-shell renormalization scheme is schemes is that I basically can only switch between schemes on a discrete level and don't have a running parameter like the renormalization scale and the MS bar schemes I use in QCD. So scheme variations are discrete in the electric sector. Um, there's a couple of examples. Um, in the interest of time, I skip example one and maybe go into some, only in some detail for, for example two. Um, that's the commonly used GMU scheme um, with the input um, GF, MW, and MZ. And in this scheme, the position of the W and Z propagators is given by the leading order expression and it doesn't receive any higher order corrections. And that's important. So the, 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 the position of the Z propagator pole is always the same, no matter at which order I calculate it. So I could directly extract it from data. Um, 
Similarly, um, since the muon decay is, is fully de determined at leading order already, so this is my minimization condition, um, so the higher order corrections are zero at that point, um, that means that um, higher order corrections are basically fully um, absorbed in, its, in the dependent parameters, and here the electromagnetic coupling alpha is a dependent parameter, so this alpha in the GMU scheme already um, contains um, some classes of higher order corrections. So that has the effect that um, in general in the GMU scheme, um, the size of higher order corrections for processes that involve Ws and, and Z um, exchange between fermion lines, um, the higher order corrections themselves are minimized. So this is therefore a scheme of choice for, for, for something like most LHC processes. However, the weak mixing angle is a dependent parameter. So in the GMU scheme, I cannot make an, a measurement, um, for example, from um, a Julian forward backward asymmetry from which I can extract the weak mixing angle because it receives higher order corrections and this extraction would then be dependent on which order I use to, to extract it. Um, <clears throat> on the contrary, we can use this prop, um, formally introduced sine W scheme, uh, sine theta W scheme, um, like, like so. And um, here, sine theta W is an input parameter. It's fixed um, and doesn't receive any corrections at higher orders. Um, that's basically my randomization condition. And therefore, it, it can be extracted from measurement um, independently. Um, drawback is that now the W propagator um, is, uh, is a derived parameter, or the W must be a derived parameter. And it does um, that the position of the W propagator pole and therefore the physical W mass receives higher order correction. So it's not a constant anymore. So we can't have all our cakes and eat them too. So um, there's something um, we have to make do with. Um, so um, the Lagrangian parameter and W that I would derive from here is not the W pole mass. It's not the same anymore. Okay. Um, so. This is basically the basics for today. This, I hope this um, got, got you a bit of a feeling and a bit of understanding what is important at um, neck or higher order calculations in the full electric standard model. Um, as you've seen, it's a bit more complex than um, QCD, what, what um, you're probably much more used to. Um, sadly, however, as much fun as the electric standard model is, Alpha is smaller than alpha, the, the, the weak coupling alpha over sine, sine um, w, SW squared, and also smaller than the QCD coupling. Therefore, even though it's um, a lot a lot more um, diverse, it's typically less important. Um, one key point to take away is that input parameter schemes play a role and um, the renormalized uh, renormalization schemes as well. And you have to um, distinguish between input parameters and derived parameters, key point. And the last one is of course infrared safety, same as um, in QCD, however, as everything is more complex, this is a bit more complex as well. Um, so you have to think about your observables and your uh, physics objects that you're going to measure um, in a bit more detail. But the general idea is basically the same as, as, as it was before. It's just that it has a couple of added nuances. Okay, then um, I think um, I leave it at that. And tomorrow we'll then have a look at um, what are the detail, or what are the precise phenomenological impacts of those and how can we incorporate those in our event generators. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot, Marek. Are there any questions already? Don't see any hands raised or any questions in the chat. Maybe everyone has to digest this a little bit over lunch or over the afternoon session. I don't know, Marek, are you going to be available in the evening for yes, further I, questions? I will be um, in the in the Gata town tonight. Yeah. Great. So anyone who can who thinks of more questions or who wants to think a little bit about the the questions that Marek has raised on the slides for the evening. Um, we will see each other again and we'll before that we'll see 
see you again at 2 p.m. after the lunch break. And thanks, Marek, for this first lecture. And see you again tomorrow or in the evening. Bye-bye.